Let's pray. Father, we ask for this time now as we look to your word that your spirit would open up our eyes and our hearts to you, that your word would penetrate our hearts and it would change us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Please be seated. Well, today is the third Sunday in the season of Lent. And Lent is meant to be a time of, of repentance and, and a, an awareness of sin that it separates us from God and what it costs Jesus for us to be reconciled to him. And it's not just to be a season for shame, even though there is a place for that, especially if we continue in our sins. Feeling ashamed is, is not the same thing as repentance of sin. Our enemy can take our striving for obedience to God and turn it into a source of pride. Repentance is the appropriate response to our sin and when we long to be in fellowship with God. Remember the story of the prideful Pharisee in Luke 18, 11. Jesus said, the, the Pharisee standing by himself prayed thus, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. Jesus pointed out to this, his disciples that this the tax collector that was standing away was not even willing to come forward. And he was beating his breast. He said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And in verse 14, Jesus compares the two men, saying, For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. And so Lent is the season where our focus is on the cross of Jesus Christ and reminding us that our salvation only comes through repentance of sin and reminding ourselves that it's at the finished work of Christ, our Savior, who hung there as our payment for our sin. It's a reminder that we have entered into a sacred and holy relationship with God in Christ. Therefore, we, we must see our sins as a reflection that we have taken our eyes off of him. And repentance is the solution to this dilemma. Before we look at our passage in Exodus 3 this morning, it's helpful to remember that this, this story was written by Moses, by God approaching Moses and giving these words that we read this morning. It was during a 40-year period where Moses and the, and the children of Israel wandered in the wilderness. Moses wrote five books that are called the Pentateuch. The Pentateuch is both a composite of individual books and a seamless narrative that renders to complete the story from creation to the death of Moses. Each book is its own way to guide Israel from Egypt to the conquest of, of the land of Canaan. Each book is linked together as the narrative of God raising up a people for his own possession that ultimately points us to the coming of the Messiah and the restoration of God's kingdom on earth. Moses wrote the story to encourage Israel to seek intimacy with God and be willing to follow him according to his word. He was going to give them the promised land, but they must know who he is first. Of course, the other reason for the Lord moving through Moses to chronicle these events is that future generations might also be able to remember how God has saved their forefathers and left them the stories and the laws of God as a written witness. This morning's passage, Moses reminded Israel that it was God who brought them up out of the land of Egypt, where they had been enslaved and in bondage for over 400 years. Let's begin right by reminding ourselves the setting of, of Exodus 3 by the very last of Exodus 2, verse 23 to 25. And during that long period, the king of Egypt died. And the Israelite groaned in their slavery and cried out, and their cry for help because of their slavery went up to God. And God heard their groaning, and he remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. So God looked on the Israelites and was concerned about them. 
So with that in mind, let's consider our story from Exodus 3. Moses is 80 years old. He's been in the land of Midian for 40 years after he fled Egypt for killing a a killer guy, a guy from Egypt who was attacking an Israelite. He married the daughter of, of a priest of Midian, and for 40 years he has tended the flock of his father-in-law Jethro. And one day as he fed, as he led the flock out into the far side of the desert, he comes to Horeb, the mountain of God. And we read in Exodus 2, 3 to 4, there the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. And Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I'll go over there to see this strange sight. Why the bush does not burn up. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush. It's important that we understand who appeared to Moses in the burning bush. Notice how easily the text moves from the angel of the Lord in verse 2 to the Lord, which the word is Jehovah, the existing one, the proper name for the one true God. And so, and when he went over to look, it says God saw it was Elohim, as God plural, called to him from within the bush in verse 4. This, easy, this, this movement kind of flows easily and was therefore distinct. It shows that the person was a real uh, being that was identified with God and yet was sent by him and was therefore distinct from him. And most biblical scholars agree that this was the pre-incarnate Son of God, Jesus. Now, there are many passages like this, but suffice it to say, in the Old Testament, the angel of the Lord is the only one who reveals the complete divine essence while still being able to be in the company of sinners. And yet, while revealing the power and the wrath of God, and is able to demonstrate absolute mercy. In this passage, the angel of the Lord appears in flames of fire within a bush, and yet the bush is not consumed. The fire points us to the fact of the divine presence, and it's a frequent symbol for the presence of God in the Old Testament, sometimes symbolizing, as in here, the threat of His holiness. An example is Hebrews 12, 29. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. This fire demonstrates the holiness of God as he purifies that which is unclean, much like sterilizing a needle with fire to kill any bacteria. It also shows that God is the one who brings judgment upon the unrighteous. The Lord shows up as fire within the bush to demonstrate that he's a consuming fire, but does not need the, f the fuel of the bush. He's able to move in, in ways that we cannot, and his holiness reveals that he's separate from us and must be approached with extreme caution. In Genesis 3, Adam and Eve are willfully disobedient to the command of God. And many would say that what they did was not that big of a deal. I mean, it doesn't seem that way, does it? They eat a piece of fruit. But this is due to a serious misunderstanding of the holiness of God. Our first parents disregarded God's command, and that meant that they had to be banished from the garden. And they could never return, but by trying to return was extreme danger to them. This is not just a difference before the created, before, and in, the, in, the, in the presence of the Creator, but it's about the pure holiness of God. The biblical symbol for this holiness is fire, and it's throughout the book of Exodus. It starts with the fire in the bush and ends with the fire on Mount Sinai in Exodus 19:18. So the Mount Sinai was covered with smoke because the Lord descended on it in fire. The smoke billowed up from it like smoke from a furnace, and the whole mountain trembled violently. Moses decides to go over and check this out. 
why the bush is not being consumed by the fire. That's when God calls out his name twice, which reveals, symbolizes urgency. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. But take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. The place was made holy because of God's presence. This is a frequent theme throughout Exodus, and it's finally resolved in the symbolism of the tabernacle, where God comes to reside with Israel in the tabernacle. But this was a starting place for Moses as the Lord's servant, as it is for anyone who enters into the service of the Lord. Until you have been on your knees, undone by the holiness of God, you have not begun to understand your desperate need of him. God commanded Moses to stop and take off his sandals because the very place where livestock had been walking was now made holy and set apart by God's presence. He wasn't banishing Moses from his presence. But he was setting the conditions for Moses to approach him. Psalm 24, 3 says, Who may ascend the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? And so God's making it simple, very simple, but definite. Take off your sandals. The God who is holy, 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 is held in such high esteem that the cherubim and the seraphim, who are before the throne of God continually, night and day, who bow before him crying out his praises, you read in Revelation chapter 4, even though they are sinless, they cover their eyes before the glory of God. They're careful as to how they approach him. And his theme, this theme continues throughout Scripture, even though the forms change. In the full Mosaic system, acceptance into the presence of God was through the atoning power of the sacrifice presented at the altar. It's Leviticus 17, you can read about that. And these sacrifices point us forward to the atoning sacrifice that God makes for us upon the cross, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. And though we, whom we have access to the Father by one spirit, according to Ephesians 2.18, the point of Moses taking off his sandals is one of simple obedience. And the reward was he was allowed into the presence of the Lord Almighty. And then God identifies himself as to who he is. I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And at this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. At this point, Moses realized who was speaking to him. And he falls on his face out of, out of fear of the God who he had always heard that to see his face meant death. Moses, the unrighteous sinner, is confronted by absolute purity and holiness, and he's undone. And God identifies himself that he is the God of Moses' father, of which we don't know anything about him other than his name was Anram. Apparently his father had revealed enough to Moses of the Jewish heritage that he knew the stories of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Again, it's important to remember that Moses is writing this story to Israel. He's encouraging them to trust in Jehovah, the same one that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob had trusted. He's pointing out to them that they had been rescued from Egypt because God remembered the covenant promise he had made to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. That from their lineage, beginning with Abraham, the people would be raised up. And the result would be that all the nations of the earth will be blessed because of their relationship with Jehovah. And they were to remember that their father Abraham had left everything behind 
and set out for an unknown destination just because God told him to. Isaac faced impossible odds of death itself and experienced a God who did provide and whose promises could be trusted. Jacob discovered the foolishness of, of living by his own cunning when he should have been trusting the promises of God. And Moses was telling Israel this story and relating it to their forefathers as a way of showing them how they should faithfully follow God. So back to our passage in Exodus 3. God explains to Moses that he has heard the cries of the people of Israel, has seen their misery and distress. Moses' task was simple. He wants to go to Pharaoh and tell him that he must let Israel leave, and leave Egypt and, and go to worship him as their God. And he was going to send them to a land he had promised Abraham. The Lord revealed to Moses that this land was already developed and ready to live in because it was occupied by the Canaanites, the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And good going to this morning, Susan, to, to be able to <laughs> say all that. These nations had become pagan in their worship. So God was giving the land to the descendants of Abraham as he had promised. And Moses was to be used of God to accomplish this in Exodus 3, 9 to 11. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I have seen the way that the Egypt, uh, Egyptians are oppressing them. So now go. I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? God was inviting Moses to be a part of something wonderful that God was absolutely going to do. And Moses' reaction is pretty much probably the same reaction that we would have had. I'm sure he was thinking, I'm a shepherd, and why should Pharaoh listen to me? And I'll bet that I won't even get in, be able to go see him. And what if someone remembers that I was once the Pharaoh's daughter's adopted son, but I left in a hurry because I killed an Egyptian. And God chose Moses for the task at hand. And really this discussion was just a preliminary for God making Moses do what he told him to do. However, God, in his patience, he knows that what he's asking is overwhelming. And Moses did not yet see all that God is going to do in and through him. But remember, until this episode, Moses had no real understanding of the God of his father, Amram. So God answers Moses' objection. And God said, I'll be with you. And this will be a sign to you that it's I who have sent you when you have brought the people out of Egypt and you will worship God on this mountain. And God promises Moses that his call would be confirmed by a future action and that God would bring him and Israel out of Egypt and they would worship God on this very mountain. For 400 years, Israel had been the servants of Egypt, but now they would come and serve and worship the God who they had a covenant relationship with because of Abraham. And Moses said to God, suppose I go to the Israelites and say, I say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they say, what's his name? What should I tell them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you're to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. And God said to Moses, say to the Israelites, the Lord, the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob has sent me to you. And this is my name forever, the name you shall call me from generation to generation. Now, the question that Moses was assuming that the children of Israel would ask is also the same question that Moses himself is asking. Who is this God and what revelation does he bring? In Genesis, the most common name for God was Yahweh, as when people called upon the name of the Lord, Yahweh. In ancient times, a name was not merely a form of address, but it was a description of character and personality. 
the mysterious use of I am who I am. Or it can be translated, I will be who I will be. God is revealing to Moses and to Israel that he will be with them. He will be ever-present. And whatever sense of inadequacy that Moses felt about himself would be answered by the Creator God, who is more than adequate for all the situations that he would find himself in. And where Moses was weak, the power of the Almighty would be brought to bear. The God who was a consuming fire that needed no outside source of energy would be there because, not because he was invited, but because he was there to accomplish his holy purpose. He would be the God who is the great I am, who would allow his people to know him for who he is. What an honor. Time and again, God would live up to his name, and even when Israel acted in unbelief and apostasy, and God delivered Israel out of the bondage of slavery and revealed himself time and again as the great I am. But they persisted from turning away from his mercy and grace to worship other gods who were, who were man-made and were not gods at all. In this morning's reading from the epistle of Paul in 1 Corinthians, Paul exhorts the Corinthian church to not repeat the sinful ways that Israel had but to repent and turn in faithful obedience to Jesus Christ as the reigning king of all. And Paul worked to establish the church at Corinth. And God had poured out his spirit in large measure upon them as they grew. And they, they flourished under Paul's ministry there, which is a, a little bit more than 18 months. 1 Corinthians was a letter from Paul in response to reports that divisions and factions had risen within the church, and there were many reports of immorality and drunkenness being tolerated within the Christian community, and the drunkenness even at the table of the Lord, the Eucharist. They're being torn apart because they had stopped following the examples of Christ and of Paul, their father, and the gospel. In our reading this morning, Paul reminded them of how Israel had been blessed by God, and his presence symbolized by the cloud had followed Israel by day and, and a, a pillar of fire by night. And Paul reminded them that, that God had given them the bread of angels and the living water from a rock which symbolized Christ, the rock of our salvation. Paul reminded them that Israel was being given all these things and being led by the very manifest presence of God, turned and they set their hearts on evil desires with the result that God killed 23,000 of them in one day. And Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 10, 11 to 13, these things happened to them as examples and were written down as warnings for us on whom the culmination of the ages has come. So if you think you're standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind, and God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. And when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. When I read Paul's letter to the Corinthians and consider all the ways that their church had turned away from Christ and began to follow the influences of godless teachers and pagan customs, all in the name of Christ, I find it all too familiar. Today's world, when someone tells me that they are Christian, I find it necessary to ask them what they mean by that. Are they saying they follow Jesus Christ as he reveals himself through his word and through the spirit? Do they use God's word as a standard of faith and practice? Or are they saying that they believe Jesus was a good man and maybe even a prophet, but certainly not God? Are they following a secularized version of Jesus that's more compatible with how they want to live and assume that he is certainly understands that they have, to, they have the right to decide what's truth. 
I'm afraid that the worship of many churches in this country would not be recognizable by the apostles, the disciples of the early church fathers. In our gospel reading this morning, Jesus tells a parable about a man who had a fig tree growing in the garden that had not produced any fruit for three years and it needed to be cut down. He went to the divine dresser instructing him to cut it down because the fig tree had no right to use up the soil. The soil it was not living into the very reason that it was created. But the vine dresser pleads with the owner and says, leave it alone for one more year, and I'll dig around it and fertilize it. If it bears fruit next year, fine, but if not, cut it down. That God doesn't punish those who have turned from obedience to God doesn't mean that he approves of their sin. Instead, it shows that he is merciful and a patient God, but the sinners should repent while there is still time. The fig tree especially depicts Israel, which will be giving a, given an extra opportunity to repent, and they rejected it. All three scripture readings this morning reveal to us a God who is not to be taken for granted because he is holy and he is worthy of our praise, our honor, and our glory, and our obedience. God is calling us to respond to his word and faithfulness. And today's readings reveal there's no excuse that we can give for not responding to his call. His name reveals that he's able to go with you and me in anything he calls us into. He'll be there with us. Any endeavor that he asks us to perform. You might say to God, I'm, I'm too weak. Child, I am, I am strong enough for you. But God, I won't know what to say. Child, I am able to give you the words. But God, I, I can't afford to go. Child, I am your provision. But Father, I'm afraid. I'm afraid. Child, I am your courage and protector. But Father, I'm sure they won't hear me. Child, I am sending you because I have a purpose for them. Trust me. To say that the world's in crisis is a big understatement. Many in our community are in crisis. Perhaps some of you here this morning or on live stream are in crisis. The invitation is to cry out to the great I am and see where he'll take you. I believe that God is calling us to greater faithfulness than ever before. And I believe that we will see greater outpourings of his spirit and of his power and glory because of it if we choose faithfulness. Moses went from being a shepherd, a shepherd who was tending somebody else's flock, a guy on the run because he was a murderer, and he turned him into one of the greatest prophets to ever live. A prophet who was honored to be with Elijah and, and, and Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. He's still read and spoken of thousands of years after his death and has now taken his place before the Lord. Only God can accomplish a journey like that. I want that for myself. I want that for you. I want us to look back and remember where God has brought us from and be amazed by his power, his mercy, and his glory. Let's pray. Father, we come to you this morning. Uh, we, are, we are in desperate need of you. As we look at all the things taking place around our country, around the world, where we are reminded that these things happen because we walked away from you. Lord, we come to you in repentance. We come to you asking you to raise us up and take us to places we never would have thought to ask. We pray that you'll bring revival to this nation and it will begin with your church. 
those who call themselves followers of Christ, that revival will be begin there, that we might demonstrate that we follow you no matter what and at what cost. It doesn't matter. We're asking you, Lord, to do a major work in you. And basically because we're so in awe of you, we want to be a blessing to you. We remember your kindness to us. We want to be faithful to you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.